ओम शांति 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 वेलकम एवरीवन So today I'm going to begin with some comments from the YouTube channel. The first one is, are you making these videos specifically for me, but you've never met me? How do you do it? And he goes on, I get a bit freaked out that when I'm having a certain question or a dilemma and all of a sudden someone asks the question and you patiently take us through it. So he's asking, how does this happen? This is something that I've spoken about before, but it's always good to talk about it once in a while. And the reason I like to talk about it is because I want to remind you how important it is for you to share your questions or your doubts. And I try to point out, but people often don't believe me, that there are other people in the satsang who are afraid to speak up or for whatever reason they don't speak up. And they have the very same question that you do. So I always am asking people to put their personal fear or whatever it is that stops them from asking their question uh, and remind you that mm, there's really only one being here. It looks like there are 50 of us. And this sort of relates to uh, his initial question. He says, are you making these videos specifically for me? Yes, but not you as a personality. You as an aspect of the oneself. How do you do it? Well, I actually don't do anything. But in the same way that everyone here has a body. So when I say, when I speak about the body, every single one of you knows what I'm talking about. We don't all have the same body. But largely, the bodies are similar. They may be tall or short, male or female, somewhere in between. They may be black, brown, white, yellow. But a body is a body. On a molecular level, we are all the same. There are no differences. These, di these differences are on the surface. And similarly, there is only one mind. There is only one awareness. Each and every one of us is an aspect of this one awareness or this one mind. And just like with bodies, there are certain peculiarities that come with a particular mind, certain samskaras or tendencies that come with that mind. But these are not based on a personality. These samskaras or these tendencies are based on previous experience and they're here to help us work out what it is we need to work out in this lifetime. But there are not 8 billion individual minds. 
there is only one mind. That which is aware. And as it moves through these individual bodies and it has these individual seeming experiences, it's differentiated by various tendencies. And so it comes to feel very much to us just in the same way that we forget that this is a body, not my body. We also forget that this is a mind, not my mind. Because these thoughts arise so spontaneously and so intimately, we have over lifetimes or eons identified with the shape of this particular body. And we say, this is my body with the age of this body, with the physical health of this body, with the hair color, the eye color. This is my body. This is not true. This is a body, and this body is formed from consciousness, manifesting to fulfill a particular, you can say, learning or understanding in this lifetime. In Vedanta, we say this is the Prabhupada karma of this body. In other words, if there is no you, if you are a fully enlightened sage, you will still wake up tomorrow morning and the body will still go on. But now, there's no body saying, this is my body. There is just this recognition of a body. And the, there's the realization and recognition that the Paravda Karma, which brought this body into existence in this lifetime, has to play itself out, has to live itself out, but this has nothing whatsoever to do with the sage. She knows herself to be that supreme being, consciousness and bliss, that one self, which is here in all these manifested ways. Similarly, there is only one mind, the mind of awareness, being, consciousness, that appears to differentiate itself for the sake of learning, of growing, of, of coming to know itself once again as the Supreme. So when we sit together like this, and we are all in deep awareness, and there's a certain amount of silence present, the one mind is what speaks, the one self. Silence speaks. This silence speaks self to self. And the waves that move through this one mind With, with some unique characteristics for each one of you, nonetheless, move through the consciousness of being like a wave. So when one speaks self to self, self hears self. The one who is listening and the one who is speaking are the same. And this leads to this seeming magical experience that I am speaking directly to this, to you personally, but it's not personal. Your mind is the one mind. You can save yourself a lot of grief if you come to understand this truth. This is not my mind. This is the foundation of the practice in Vedanta or Advaita of neti neti, not this, not this. This is not just a simple pushing aside of a thought pattern. This is a recognition of truth. That to which you refer as I, you are not. 
the one self manifesting as all of this is who you are. One mind. The foundation of all. This one mind concept, of course, comes more from the perspective of, you can say, the Zen tradition. In Zen, or in many Buddhist traditions, they call this one mind big mind in order to differentiate it from the individual or personal mind in the same way that in Advaita, we say the self with a capital S. And we differentiate that from the self with a small s, meaning the personality. So in the same way, as there is one self and many cells, there is also one mind masquerading as many minds. When these minds are in union with one another, they return to the foundation of one mind and one self. And then this one self speaks to this one mind. So this is how this happens. No one is doing anything. It is the nature of truth. It is the nature of reality. So please don't get freaked out. It's quite a natural way of being. As you become more and more comfortable in the space of one self or the space of one mind, you come to realize that the more you become quiet, the more you actually begin to hear the flow of consciousness through life. You don't hear people's minds. You can't read people's minds. I am not reading your minds. This is just the flow of consciousness. What we do with the inquiry, you can say, is we sit on the bank of the river and watch what flows by. This is one consciousness, one self. So if you say, I get freaked out when this happens, I say, keep quiet, keep watching. Keep observing, keep witnessing. You'll soon come to see the flow of this river of consciousness. No more fear then, no more freaked out. The next person says, where does the faith come from that Bhagavan will look after everything once the ego, the desires and the mind are surrendered? Again, this is not the usual way of being in the world, is it, to live from faith. But if you look into the spiritual traditions of the world, there is this reminder in every one of the religions. In Christianity, in the Bible, it says, thy will be done, not mine. This is an element of faith, isn't it? In the Vedanta tradition, we talk about the path of bhakti, the surrender of everything at the feet of the Lord. This is the very same principle, isn't it? In Buddhism, it's spoken of as emptiness, the realization that all phenomena, all objects, all coming and going is empty of any inherent self. There is no meanness in it. And so the practice in Buddhism is to bring the attention repeatedly and continuously back to the empty space, the empty light of awareness, and to remain there. This is also an element of surrender, isn't it? This is the practice also in Vedanta of neti neti, not this, not this. It's the recognition that I am allowing everything to go its own way, to be surrendered into the light of awareness, to be surrendered at the feet of the Lord. I am surrendering this entire ego and saying, thy will be done, not mine. 
So this faith element is there in all the traditions. And if you're asking this question, it's also within you. Where does the faith come from that Bhagavan will look after everything? This is a particular mm, practice that you can take up if you are a devotee of Sri Ramana Maharshi. Bhagavan, of course, means the Lord, so this can be anyone, anything, can't it? It can be from any tradition. The Lord is present in every tradition, whether he's called Bhagavan, she is called God, whatever makes no difference. This supreme, this one self is given everything and one's life is surrendered into the service of that supreme, however it's conceived of. And one becomes Bhagavan Das, In the Hindu tradition, Bhagavan meaning the Lord, Das meaning servant, Bhagavan Das, servant of God, servant of the Lord. So this is a definitely a practice that one can take up. Without the element of faith, you can see fairly easily that you will struggle because you will be trying to take the mind where it cannot go. So at some point, you will have to put the mind down and trust. You'll have to take the next step off that cliff. This is, a, is an act of faith. It's an act of trust. But you don't need to do it prematurely. If you're here, you have already come to this place where you are beginning to trust little by little, if not fully, the path that has brought you here, the life that has brought you here, the lifetimes that have brought you here. You are beginning to trust this now. So open this heart of trust and wisdom and faith, not because I tell you to, but because you can find it in every single spiritual tradition. The truth of spiritual and religious traditions is that the foundation truths, the foundation understandings, the foundation insights can be found in every single one of the traditions. This is not hundreds of rules and regulations depending upon the religion or the spiritual tradition. This is a handful of truths that show up in every one of the world's great spiritual traditions. These are the elements that you can trust because they are not bound by space and time. They're not bound by culture. They show up in every culture. They show up through all the prophets, all the sages and all the saints in every culture. So this can give you some foundation on which to build this trust and this faith. That if you surrender everything, thy will be done, whether that is some supreme sense of God, or that is Bhagavan, Ramana, Sri Ramana Maharshi, or Yogi Ramsarat Kumar, or Ananda Moima, or the Buddha. However that works for you, build that trust in what will open your heart and take you forward as you slowly build the foundation of faith and trust that the path you are walking, the one which brought you here tonight, that you can trust it. You can have faith in it. You can have faith in the gurus, faith in the wisdom teaching, faith in the Buddha, whatever it is. You came here and you have, will continue to come here to end your suffering. The key to ending that suffering is faith. So begin to build that foundation brick by brick. 
and all will be well. This person says, I have a question that troubles me a lot. Could you please help? I've been doing self-inquiry and being a student, I have to go to certain places and sometimes meet old friends. And the environment I'm in changes often. Sometimes I'm reminded Oh, sometimes I have past thoughts and memories, and I notice this mind tries to cling to them. Yes, very good, very good. Every single person here knows that has the, had this experience, no? Of the mind clinging to some thought or some memory. Everyone has the, had this experience. Again, one mind. This mind you think is so unique to you is the same mind that everyone else is dealing with. It's not unique to you. This is why we can say, don't identify with it. Don't claim it. It is not yours. It's simply tendencies, conditioning, and so on. If you don't grasp it, it will go. I've tried doing self-inquiry about who is seeing all of these things. Very good. Now I would just say, eliminate the belief that you are trying. Just do it. The reason you say you are trying is because you think the result is not being attained, but the result is none of your business. Just do the inquiry. This comes back to the trust piece, doesn't it? To the faith piece. The saints and sages have proven the truth of this path over millennium. Why should you mistrust it now? Put your faith in the tradition, in the gurus, in the teachers, and in the, in the uh, traditions as they've come down to us. I've tried doing self-inquiry about who is seeing all these things, to whom these memories are coming to. The mind slows down a little bit, but I cannot keep inquiring. I cannot continue for the long time. And again, when mind wins, uh, again, when mind wins, it tries to flood and those thoughts come in again and sometimes worse. Sometimes I cannot sleep because of thoughts. And some days I wake up with random thoughts in my head. I don't know where it came from. During this time, when I couldn't, when I wasn't able to keep inquiry for a long time, I came to YouTube. I come to YouTube and I, I attend these thoughts on the other spiritual, spiritual teachings. So I want to point out to you all, when I talk about don't identify with your thoughts. This is a perfect example of identifying with your thoughts. And each and every one of you is familiar with this. This is the way the dialogue sounds in your head. I've tried doing self-inquiry. This mind slows down a little bit, but I cannot keep inquiring. Again, when mind when the mind wins, it tries to flood those flood me with those thoughts again. Flood me. Sometimes the work. Uh, sometimes it gets worse. I cannot sleep because of thoughts. I wake up with random thoughts in my head. I don't know where it came from. During those times when I wasn't able to keep inquiry for a long time. I came to YouTube and attended these satsangs and other spiritual teachings. Do you understand what I'm pointing toward here? Can you hear this when I emphasize the eyes and the me's? This is the gr ground of being for inquiry, isn't it? Because in this one paragraph here of three or four sentences, 
there are at least six or eight opportunities to ask yourself if this is your mind. To whom am I referring when I say I? You have to catch this conditioned dialogue in the mind. You cannot simply always be pushing it away with neti neti and giving it no, bringing no wisdom and no understanding to it. If you want to really use the inquiry to uproot this sense of I-ness, this identification, this sense of me-ness, there is a time to be quiet and observe and witness what is going through your own mind and realize that in the span of just 30 seconds, you have said I or indicated some form or level of identification with the personal six or eight times. This is the fertile ground to ask, who am I referring to when I say I? This will very quickly unravel this. Why? Because you can hear in this comment the level of identification that is there with the thoughts, with the experiencing. This is a very identified moment in, that is identified with me as a person, as a personality with these thoughts. Fertile ground for asking to whom am I referring? Pulling attention away from what is being pointed at in terms of referring in things and bringing it back to the source. Who? Ask this question. This is inquiry in the active process. This is when you can no longer just say, not this, not this, not this, or you can no longer say, who am I, who am I, who am I, who am I, and you feel like it's not working for you. This is why. Because you are not catching the six or eight opportunities that are arising every 30 seconds in your mind when you could have asked, to whom am I referring when I say I? Thereby withdrawing attention from the objects in the mind, turning it toward the heart. Hmm? And so they go on. My next question is, <clears throat> I know satsang is very helpful in this path. It helps to keep one on track. But I've noticed I tend to attend satsang for instant relief from this storm of thoughts and other guilt thoughts that arise when I wasn't able to control my habit of getting into desires and getting into small traps of mind. You said I should use whatever is in my toolbox to get my feet back on track. This one mind says I should get back onto track and not get involved in these thoughts and tries to attend satsang. This is very good, right? This is definitely recognizing that you are in trouble at this moment, right? That the mind has captured you, that you are severely identified and then using the teachers, the teachings, the satsangs, the videos, the books to bring yourself back into alignment with whatever level of truth you can get at that moment. But to the important recognition is that you are not this confusion. You are not this identification. This is important at this moment. But again, now I'm sure most of you heard how many times the person said, mine, I, you, your, again, over and over and over, identifying with this pattern in the mind. Understand this is not the truth that's being identified with here. It's just a pattern in the mind. So as you do, you do the inquiry, what you need to be doing is you need to be looking and understanding to some degree what are the patterns in this mind 
how do they work? And how can I just simply say I'm not this pattern? Or ask this question, to whom am I referring? When I say I, this point of identification, the point of identification is looking out into the world, looking out into the objects, looking into the sensation, looking into the sense experience, and then saying that is me. The inquiry is saying that is a sense object, that is an object in the world, that is a thought. Who is the one who is aware of the thought? Who is the one who, is, who seems to be having this experience? This is inquiry. So begin to know with absolute certainty, this is looking out, this is looking in, this is looking toward the world, this is looking toward the source. If you just get this distinction, your whole life will change like that. If you simply become very, very astute, very, very good at knowing when you are looking out and when you need to rein that in and turn it back within, this is the inquiry. The other thing I want to say about this is you can hear this is, happens in every, almost everyone's mind, especially in these early stages. This mind says I should get back onto track and not get involved in these thoughts and tries to attend and, and try to attend satsa. This is a very judgmental statement to make about oneself. There is no need to say, tell yourself that you are off track. In fact, the opposite is true. As soon as you realize that you slipped away into conditioning, the moment you realize that, you are back. Recognize that. Oh, I slipped away into conditioning. Don't beat yourself up about it. You know, remember the, the, the example that I use of giving a puppy a treat? If you give a puppy a treat, it becomes your friend. If you hit it with a stick, it becomes a mean dog. Mind is exactly the same. Your mind will become meaner and meaner the more you judge yourself, the more you criticize yourself. So this doesn't mean don't be honest with yourself. It means don't be harsh with yourself and know in a moment of reflection, oh, I was just lost. Now I am back. The emphasis is on I am back. In this moment, I am aware. Maybe I wasn't aware before. Maybe I was lost in some form of identification before. Now I am back. I am here. I know I am here. And just go on. No residue, nothing left about what happened a minute ago. Here, now, I am here. Okay, go forward. Rejoice, be happy. <laughs> you are here. So this is the practice. Not being self-critical. Be self-aware. Know that you are aware. Move forward happily. And they catch themselves in the next paragraph. On the other hand, my mind criticizes me for running away from the thoughts and seeking relief elsewhere outside. So understand that there's a difference between seeking relief outside by going out to the bar, right? By seeking romance, some relief from your pain. That is different, isn't it? You all know this from watching the satsang. Watching a satsang is to bring your attention back to the source, right? And I'm not criticizing going out to the bar and having a good time once in a while. Please, I don't want to get messages about that. <laughs> dance your dance, but understand when you're going out and when you're coming back. This is what I said before. This is what's necessary. This, all of this can be broken down into a few simple pr principles, can't it? Who is aware here? I am not this, I am not this. I am looking out, I am looking toward the source. If you simplify this, bring it down, then we're talking about these tools that are available in our toolbox. 
so that we can stop this conditioned habit of driving ourselves out through the senses into the world, into experience, and begin rather instead to inquire, who am I? Who am I? Is that which is aware here now? And if it is, relax, be present, be happy, be here, and let the awareness itself do the work. It is awareness in this moment which does the work, not me. If there is a me doing the work, right? Eventually you will have to let go of that me. So do it now rather than later. If you need that me to remind yourself to look at a video, to listen to uh, spiritual teaching, to chant the name, to listen to some uh, kirtan or some spiritual music. If you need that me to do that, great. Be thankful for that me that remembers that. Don't beat it up because it didn't remember it a minute ago. Be happy for it now. Be grateful for it now. In this moment, I am here. I am aware. And my face, the light of my being is turned toward the Supreme. If it lasts a minute or it lasts a lifetime, be happy. You have turned toward the Supreme. You have fulfilled your purpose in this moment. And then they are so, there's so much compassion goes out to this person because they finish this note by saying, I know it is all in the mind, but it's so clouded from where I am at at this moment. The mind meaning the mind is so clouded. So this is why it's necessary for us to have compassion. Compassion for this mind that appears to suffer, that appears not to know itself. This is the conditioning of a mind that has not yet realized its nature as being consciousness. But again, I remind you all, this is not my mind. This is a conditioned mind. If you simply acknowledge in that moment, ah, oh, this is a conditioned mind, this is fear, this is doubt, this is judgment, this is criticism. As soon as you see that, you are back. You are back in the wisdom of knowing what is present, and then you can turn from whatever that bad habit or that bad uh, samskara or that conditioning was, toward the light of being, toward the recognition of being, consciousness and bliss, asking yourself the question, am I aware? Who am I? In order to withdraw attention from the distraction, from the cloudiness, from the depression, from the sadness, from the fear, and putting it on the heart of being, turning back toward the source until you are finally one day as you will be pulled into the heart of being because what you are seeking through these practices is also seeking you and when you become ready and willing and able this heart of being this one self which has called you to this moment will also draw you into its own heart, into the self. And all of this that you have been experiencing will be known to have been just a dream. It was just a dream. And in the same way that you awaken in the morning and go, oh, whew, that was a dream. I'm sure glad that's over. At the moment of recognition of the self, a very similar kind of feeling can come up. Oh, that was a dream. I'm so happy that is over. Now I don't believe this mind anymore, this conditioned mind. Now I see that I am just the self. 
I am here as being and consciousness. Okay. Please raise your hand if you have a question or you'd like to make a comment. I just, I don't know how to put this question forward. So whenever I try to inquire, right? So there are two things that happen. So one is that I fall into a space where I'm just there, like, no, I'm at ease. So I think that is a state of being, but I do not know. It's very good to be there, but at the same time, I'm aware of that state. And the other thing that happens is um, sometimes I I just want to come out of that state. It feels a little bit boring, maybe. I don't know. I just want yes, to get out of that state. So yes, yes. I, 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 I struggle between this. Like It seems like a dead end for me. I don't know how to move forward from this space. Yes. Okay, very, very good. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that you are standing in exactly the place I was talking about a moment ago, and I talk about it often. You're standing in that recognition, if awareness is there, that if you look in one direction, out into the world, you're not interested in looking there. And if you turn in the other direction, you will be looking toward the self. But... In order to maintain that position, the mind does not want you to maintain that position. This is why you say, I experience boredom. Boredom is the mind saying, please come back, come back to me. Look out here. Look at me. Look at this ego. Please give me something to do. Please give me something to make me feel better. I don't like this boring. This is the mind's enticing you to come back into the senses, to come back into the world. On the other hand, when you say, how did you say it? You said, uh, like I, I just go into a space within myself where I might ease, where there is a lot of peace and it, it basically feels like a good place to be. But at the same time, I'm aware that this is happening. Yes, very good. Yes. So this is the moment of inquiry. As soon as there's this recognition, I am aware of peace. I am aware of this very subtle space. Now is the time to ask, who is aware of this? What's happening is you have turned toward the heart but now you are taking the space of being as an object. So this is the point where, at which if you inquire, who is this I that is aware of this peace? Now you will go deeper. And what's happening is you are standing at that point where if you turn and go deeper through the question, who am I or what is aware here? Then you will go deeper and you will also be, lose the tendency to want to go back out through boredom. And the reason is you will give that mind that wants to go back out saying, I'm bored, give me something to do. You will give it something to do. You will look more deeply into the inquiry, more deeply into the question, what or who is aware here now? I actually try to do that as well. But when I try to inquire who is that that is aware of this happening, right? For a moment, I, I just lose track of everything. And immediately I hit a dead end. I don't know what to do. And then the mind says like, okay, it's boring. Let's come out of this. Yes, yes. So I would suggest to you that now you just have to be persistent because what's actually happening is this mind that does not want you to go there is pulling you back out. 
It's saying, don't go there, don't go there. If you go there, I will die. If you go there, you will lose me. This is absolutely true. So this requires that you, it's like walking up to a door and needing to push on it or knock on it or tap on it a few times before that door opens. So just be persistent. Thank you. Do it over and over. And when the mind is, when, when you hear that thought in your mind that says, um, I am bored, I want something else, uh, I don't know what's happening here, I am confused, uh, this is frightening, I don't know if that's happening for you, but for many people there comes up this fear that comes up, this is the death of the ego fear, this comes up. So whatever comes up, ask, who is this I that is aware of this? Who am I? What is aware here? And just keep coming back to that point. If you keep tap tapping on that door, that which is calling you home is eventually going to open it. Or it's going to tell you, turn around. It's going to say, you are knocking on the door, but you are already here. So if you turn around and you look, you will see that you are not trying to get into a room. You are already in the room. So you don't need to keep knocking anymore. You are here. Just keep going. Be persistent. And be very compassionate for what, you, what your mind is telling you you don't understand or you don't get. This is the game, the trick of the me sense. Just keep going. You are knocking on a very subtle door. Just keep knocking and all will be well. One of the hardest things about inquiry is the recognition or the realization that you cannot trust anything your mind is telling you. You simply can't, right? Because all of our lives, we have gone along and we have gotten wherever we are in our lives now and we think we're, we will get wherever we want to go in the future by using this mind. This mind has kept us here. It's kept us alive. It has provided the structure for our lives. And so we have a deep faith in this mind that if we just keep using it properly in some way, that we will somehow succeed in our quest to understand who am I. But at some point, we come to realize that the ways which have created for us a sense of personhood, a sense of success, a sense of failure, if that happens to be your particular dharma in this life, whatever this sense of personality has been created around, that this is unreliable at best. And so this gives us the faith and the persistence to keep going with the inquiry when the mind is saying, no, please stop. When the sense of me, the sense of personality is saying, no, stop, please. Don't go any further. You will kill me. And of course, then our response at that moment to this ego needs to be very compassionate, but at the same time needs to have enough persistence and enough will to say, fine, kill me now, I'm ready. So that this mind will retreat from identification with the body and with the thoughts of the mind so that the heart can open and you can be pulled directly and quickly into the heart of being, into the one self, that which you are.
there are moments when you need to be as kind and as compassionate to this belief in the separate self as you possibly can be. The belief in the separate self has a deep root, doesn't it? It has a deep root. So when you become aware of that root, bring to the moment compassion, love, kindness for this belief in the separate self while at the same time understanding in a very profound and direct and clear way, I am not that. Both things can be held simultaneously and, and for many people need to be for a period of time. Knowing that I am the self, I also know that there are these tendencies there are these, there is this belief in separation, which is still active in some way. And so I continue the work to uproot this belief in separation and to open the heart in the full recognition of being, consciousness, and bliss. This is the way of inquiry. All right, dear friends. I wish you all a beautiful day, a good night's sleep if it's nighttime for you, a beautiful day if it's daytime. You are that which is aware, the one self, unborn and undying. Here now, as being, consciousness, and bliss. Hari Om Tatsang.